Good morning, everyone. We're getting ready to say get started here with the KPICI planning orientation and community checkbox training. And this is our first KPC training event of this new state fiscal year that started July 1. So we're really excited to have you all here and um, hope that this will be useful for you. Um, it's our first time doing the orientation in a Zoom platform. We've done this before in a virtual platform, but new technology is allowing for, for some new features. So we hope to be able to make this a smooth um, experience for you all and that we'll, we'll learn a lot together. Um, probably not going to talk too much more. We are recording the, the training today um, for future training purposes. The things that it might be used for would be if anybody wants to check back to that recorded training just as a refresher or if they want to share the link with somebody else on their coalition or in their organization, that'd be a good thing to do. Um, we will take a break at around uh, noon for about an hour. We'll come back at one and start back up and finish the training um, event this afternoon, early this afternoon. Um, so a quick tour of the Zoom room that we're in today. We'll have a PowerPoint presentation going through the full meeting, the full training. Um, do encourage you to use webcams if, if you have them and if are, you're able and willing. Um, it seems to help with engagement and participation, and then we can see if there's a really confused look or if we've put somebody to sleep, which is what I tend to do. Um, so we'll, we'll facilitate that as best we can. Feel free to use the chat um, to keep engaged. Um, you're, you're welcome to call attention to things that you see in somebody's background. If you want somebody like Joe, I haven't met you yet. Would you mind reading the <laughs> Would you mind reading the framed word art on your on the on your wall? Um, you can ask those kind of questions. But Joe can say, "No, I will not read that to you today." But thank you for asking. Um, any of those responses is okay. Um, we'll continue on and try to yeah try to help this be as community sort of a feel as possible. Um, we will check the chat for questions and maybe answer them in the middle of presentations, but we'll likely take some breaks and check in and see if there are any questions in the chat. And so then we'll share those questions in the chat and, and ask the presenter to, to respond to them um, or put them on the parking lot if it's something that we'll have to answer some other time. Um, so we'll probably mute our microphones and our phones during the presentation time and then unmute when people say, "Is there are there any questions or does that make sense? Um, or Joe, do you want to read the thing on your wall? Um, <laughs> sorry, Joe. Um, this, is, this is probably a scary introduction to you. I'm sorry, Joe. I, it, it will be okay. Um, all right. So in the chat right now, I'm going to share a link to a Google Docs document. Oh, it was on your own. I can't remember what they called it. And that Google Docs document is just for... Um, Che checking our demographic representation um, for this meeting. And so that's for our federal reporting. It is important information for the federal government to, to fund the states in a way that helps us better serve all populations of our state. So all citizens in Kansas have an equitable chance at receiving these trainings. And so that Google Doc helps us with reporting data to make big data to help us um, guide our, our resources that we can offer to the communities in Kansas. Um, so appreciate you doing that. It's voluntary. Um, no names are attached and, and you're not required to do that. And if the Google Doc doesn't work for you to select some of those items, let me know in the chat and I'll see if I can get a quick fix before the meeting's over. Um, I think with that, does anybody have any other announcements from the training team before we transition to Stephanie's presentation part? All right. Okay, then we will move on. And Stephanie and others, just let me know when I need to advance the slides, go slower, go faster, whatever it might be. And I'll open my mic every now and then with a, hey, we've got only five minutes left um, kind of notices. So thank you all for being here. And Stephanie Reinhardt, I'd like to welcome you uh, to help get us started. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our FY21 orientation. 
for all of you, our new Kansas Prevention Collaborative Community Initiative Coalitions. My name is Stephanie Reinhardt, and I am the Prevention Program Manager at Kansas Department for Aging and Disabilities Behavioral Health Commission. I would also like to introduce my two behavioral health prevention consultants, Chris Bush and Lindsay Spooner Gabalti, who will be speaking later on today and presenting information. You all were identified based on your proven commitment to working to reduce and prevent substance abuse in your communities. KDADS and our partners at KPC, we look forward to the opportunity to work with you and to get to know you and your communities. Through this process, you will be guided through the strategic prevention framework with the goal of not only supporting your prevention activities and strategies, but also building your coalition's infrastructure and future sustainability. So don't wanna take up too much of your time. So I just wanna thank you for your attendance today. And on behalf of KDADS, thank you for your investment in the lives of our children and families in Kansas. Next slide. Now we would like to take a little bit of time to get to know you all a little bit better. Um, I am going to divert a little bit away from this slide because I've noticed that we have some other coalitions on the, on the uh, Zoom call also today. And so I don't want to um, neglect the opportunity for them to introduce themselves also. Um, but I will start um, with um, asking that um, all of the representatives from Marion County um, introduce themselves as uh, one of the KPICI Planning Cohort 5 grantees for this year. Do we have anyone on for Marion County? I see Terry on for Mary. Okay, they're 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 working out some some kinks. We'll come back to them. Um, I did see someone from Leavenworth County Youth Achievement Center. Would you like to introduce yourself? Yes. Can you hear me fine? Yes. Awesome. Thank you, uh, Joe Bias with the Leavenworth Youth Achievement Center. And was there anyone else from Leavenworth? Uh, no, ma'am, just myself, I'm afraid. Okay, great. I am going to scroll down because I did see some other individuals. Um, Jessica Thompson, would you like to introduce yourself from Thrive Allen County? Yeah, uh, my name is Jessica Thompson. I'm with Thrive Allen County, uh, and we are part of the implementation uh, cohort. Great. Thank you for attending today. And I see, I spy with my eye, I see Angie Mahoney. Would you like to introduce yourself? Hi, I'm Angie Mahoney with Rise Up Reno Prevention Network. Great. Good to see you this morning. And any, anyone else from any of our coalitions? Well, again, thank you all and welcome. And when we get Marion set up and on the line, we will have the, oh, there we are, Terry, hi. Hi, good morning. Good morning, uh-oh, went back to mute. Oh, there you are. We're still trying to get all- connected. No problem, we're just doing quick introductions. Would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah, I'm Terry Biebermeyer, I'm the uh, Director of FACT, uh, Families and Communities Together Incorporated. We're in Marion County. Um, we serve all of Marion County. And uh, this is Erin Hine. She is the she's we're she's the mobilizer for our, our grant. Um, uh, I don't know if you can see her. Or not. <laughs> and Crystal is here with us. 
Great. Well, glad you could make it this morning. Thanks. With this rainy weather that we're having. <laughs> Next slide. This is our agenda for today. As you see, we started off with the welcome um, and we are going to go into um, talking a little bit about our Kansas Prevention Collaborative and I'm going to give them the opportunity, a representative um, from their agency to speak a little bit about um, their agency and then we'll go into talking about scopes of work, reporting requirements, KCTC overview, coalition capacity survey, the community checks checkbox training, and then we'll close. And as Chad said, we will have some breaks in between, but we have a, an afternoon that is planned um, with a lot of information. Um, but again, we are recording. And also, if you have any questions along the way, um, please enter your questions in the chat box and someone will be able to answer it for you. Next slide. So this is just a um, overview of the KPC, Kansas Prevention Collaborative. As you see, um, KDAD's Prevention and Pro Promotion Services contracts with the KPC. And currently we have four contracts uh, with DECA, um, who does our coalition training and technical assistance, the Learning Tree Institute of Greenbush, that works with our data collection, analysis, and evaluation, KU Center for Community Health and Development that does data collection and analysis and evaluation, and WSU Community Engagement Institute that uh, works with our communication and connections. So at this time, I am going to pass it off next slide to I believe it's DECA um, with a, a brief uh, overview of what they do in the KPC and how they work with our coalitions here in Kansas. Sure, thanks Stephanie. My name is Chrissy Mayer and I'm with DECA. Um, additionally on the call today we have Crystal Dalmasso who's actually sitting with our Marion County folks, um, Dina Kemp who uh, serves our coalitions in Southeast Kansas, uh, Mike Parson who serves as our uh, program coordinator, and then Deanne Armstrong is also on the line. She's previously been our Northeast um, Kansas Community Support Specialist, uh, but she is actually transitioning out. And so she's actually doing some training for some new folks who are coming on board as well. Um, essentially, our role yeah, is to provide training and technical assistance to community coalitions. Um, we have five community support specialists that service the entire state. We work with funded and unfunded coalitions. We provide a variety of um, e-learning modules and toolkits to help communities uh, better understand the SPIF process and just general coalition um, capacity building and mobilization. Um, so you'll be seeing lots of different training opportunities um, coming out of our office and we are glad to be part of the KPC. And I believe now the next slide will turn it over to um, Greenbush initially for the evaluation team. I'm you here. Good morning. Hi, this is Lisa Cheney. I'm at Greenbush or the Learning Tree Institute at Greenbush. And we work with uh, kind of in tandem with the KU Center for Community Health and Development. I'll let Dola talk about that in a little bit to kind of provide supports around data collection, data analysis, and getting you some reports that you need to do the work that you have to do. One of our big pieces is the Kansas Communities at Care Student Survey, and we're going to talk a little bit more about that later on in our in our day. But that is uh, for students in 6th, 8th, 10th, and 12th grade, and it provides outcome data for school districts and for counties and for the state and for our gambling task forces. Um, to be able to have information that they need to be able to assess areas of need and to be able to evaluate whether we're meeting our goals through our prevention efforts. Uh, another piece of what we do is in terms of evaluation is working with uh, prevention education to collect some pre-information and some post-information to again be able to tell the success of um, strategies that you're going to be implementing. Um, we help with you to build an evaluation plan. So uh, working through the assessment process and through implementation and evaluation. 
And you'll have um, uh, with me today are two of our evaluators that are going to be working with um, you as grantees. Kristen Hewer is here today and Stacy Sharman is here today. We're happy that they're going to be working with you as part of your KPC team for supports. Dola? Good morning, everyone. This is Dola Gabriel with KU Center for Community Health and Development. And on the call also is Sana Schneeberger. She'll be uh, participating in training and technical assistance uh, toward grantees in this um, fiscal year. Uh, KU is responsible for the process data. Uh, Lisa mentioned um, outcome data for uh, Greenbush. And so we are uh, on the side of the process data. So everything that you're doing, we call them accomplishments and those items are, or those accomplishments are entered into the community checkbox and we'll be spending uh, a large part of the afternoon with you. So I'll save the rest for later. Good morning. Thank you, Dola. Um, my name is Chad Childs and I greeted you all this morning and then made things suddenly awkward. Um, with Joe, and I'm sorry for that. Welcome, Joe. But that's a little bit of, how, I guess, how we do what we do. Um, but we are working to support the coalitions in some behind the scenes ways, um, mostly in those areas of connection and communication. So there are incredible things being done all across the state. And so we want to try and share those things with others um, and help make sure that the coalitions are learning from each other because you all know this work and, and um, challenges and barriers and ways to overcome them better than we do. So we want to help connect the KPC partners and connect coalitions with each other. And so we do a few do that through a few different ways, including Prevention Works, which is a statewide prevention coalition. We facilitate that and host those gatherings. Um, prevention Talks is a monthly, um, sometimes more often, but a monthly podcast that we use to share conversations about all things prevention. Um, and, and we can talk more about that later. We also offer the KansasPreventionCollaborative.org website and um, communication hub services in a few different ways with Prevention Works, Prevention Talks, KPC Connections, KPC Sparks, which is a new thing, um, Facebook and Twitter, and um, email messaging that we use through Microsoft Outlook and um, MailChimp uh, as an as a email server. Uh, we also coordinate other statewide initiatives, training and messaging, and um, really work toward that goal of um, helping make sure that people in their communities have what they need to, to be successful in prevention strategies. So um, glad to be here with you all today. Also from Wichita State's Community Engagement Institute and our prevention initiatives, joining us on the Zoom call today are Heather Winkleplek, who's one of the hosts of Prevention Talks talking about all things prevention. And Gabriela Hernandez, um, I think, yeah, Gabby's webcam's on down there. And so Gabriela is helping out with our youth connection. So Kansas Youth Connect, KYC. Um, and that's something that is serving youth coalitions, uh, which is something that is growing and for good reason. Um, so she's working with our youth development, um, partnering closely with DECA to, to help with Kansas Youth um, connect and and the kyc3 conference that they had this year virtual so with that i'm going to pass things on to chris and, bush yeah, and go ahead, before, we, before we move on i did want to recognize i'm not sure if he's prepared but we do have juan baez on on the line so um i didn't know whether he uh wanted or was prepared to introduce himself but i am glad that he is here yes juan if you would like to introduce yourself Yeah, good morning, everyone. Hey, Juan. <laughs> hey. Uh, yes, good afternoon. Well, good morning, everyone. My name is Juan Baez, and I work as a problem gambling specialist with KDADS. And so I'm on here to, uh, to, as well, to provide any support to any new task forces or coalitions. Uh, as a problem gambling program, we do offer uh, no out of pocket cost treatment to problem gamblers and concerned others and also do quite a bit of prevention around problem gambling. So if at any time anyone needs any support with problem gambling prevention, as you all know, there's a lot of co-occurrence with uh, problem gambling, uh, gaming, uh, video gaming, which is now 
very strongly tied together with gambling. And so we do do a lot of work around uh, video game education and gambling education. So if at any point anyone needs any support, we are more than happy to, to also engage in prevention in communities around problem gambling and video gaming. And uh, yes, please let us know. We'd be happy to help and provide technical assistance and just uh, educate communities in these issues as well. So. Thank you. I believe as I've looked at my list that everyone has either introduced themselves or been introduced. So um, at this time, we are going to pass it on to Chris Bush and thank you all for your introductions. Good morning, everyone. Um, thank you, uh, Stephanie, and to the uh, KPC team as well. And uh, welcome um, newcomers uh, to FY21. Um, for the next few slides, I'll briefly touch bases on highlighting uh, some of the work um, that will take place um, over this next year. Um, Chad, if you can go ahead and advance to the next slide. So one of the main things that um, we'll be utilizing um, during this grant cycle is the utilization of the strategic prevention framework. And you'll probably hear us often refer to this as the SPIF as a, just a short acronym, um, instead of saying strategic prevention framework. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about this as we move through the slides. Um, we also encourage um, that you all um, collaborate and work with 12 key community sectors. Um, you'll see that listed on the side, on the right side of your screen, um, one through 12. Um, some of those are just youth, parents, businesses, media, school, um, and so forth. And we understand that there may be some struggle um, with getting those individuals um, to be a part of your community sectors. And we understand also, just from previous years, um, that some of those individuals serve in two or three capacities, um, and that, that's fine as well. So, um, but the, the goal is that if we can engage as many as those as we can to be able to help you through with your work um, throughout this um, fiscal year, we'll be able to be an asset to you. Next slide, please, chat. And these are some of the grant deliverables and reporting that we'll be asking um, throughout the years, monthly financial reports, fiscal reports, quarter reports, um, you entering information in the community checkbox, um, doing a comprehensive needs assessment, uh, capacity building plan, evaluation plan, um, doing a sustain sustainability work plan, um, and also participating um, in the KCTC data, developing the plan. Um, if you can move on, chat, please. Um, and with Part of the uh, expectations, we just ask uh, that you have most of your work turned in in a timely manner. And we are aware and um, know that things come up. And um, so long as there's, there's communication um, a day before, two days before that uh, you may not be able to get something in, um, we're flexible. Um, if we haven't heard from you, um, you will most likely hear from um, our team, um, which consists of KDADS and the KPC team in regards to some of the information that are required uh, to be due um, by a certain time. You can go ahead and advance to the next slide, Chad. Um, a lot of our work is face-to-face -face trainings, um, and we also have um, done online trainings, and all of you have probably been impacted by COVID-19 um, over the last five months, so a lot of your work, even outside of doing work with the KPICI, um, has probably been engaged with doing online uh, trainings and, and so forth using Zoom, uh, what other other platforms. Um, so over the next few months, again, we'll play this by ear. Um, it is our goal and we're hoping at some point that we can reconvene back to face-to-face uh, -face trainings. Um, and if not, we are um, set up um, to move forward with our work. Um, it does not prohibit us from being able to make any um, positive um, changes um, with the work that we have um, set out for the next year um, with working with you all. And we'll make for sure if things changes that um, KDADS or the KPC team will um, update you um, uh, within probably hopefully 30 days, um, if not a little bit shorter with um, changes upon if we're gonna meet face-to-face -face or online. Um, as of right now, we can just go ahead and prepare um, that we're most likely scheduled to do more of a online type training or um, Zoom type training. So again, but just keep looking for emails and updates on that as we move forward with our work. You can advance to the next slide, so chat. Um, a lot of our work is approved through evidence-based training. 
Um, you'll be adapting strategies that are approved um, by KDADS, which the team has also collaborated with some other um, individuals to uh, make for sure that the, the strategies and evidence-based practice, practices that we have in place are something that is appropriate and aligns with the work um, that you will be doing. And again, that's the fidelity um, checklist and so forth. You can advance to the next top slide, chat, please. Again, so the strategic prevention framework, um, as we refer to it as the SPIF, um, is a framework that we will use as our underpinning or um, our focal lenses to be able to help us be able to meet the objectives and the goals um, that we expect from you all to be able to utilize. Um, and most of you are probably aware um, or um, familiar with um, the SPIF and how it works. And this is something that um, definitely um, outlines our work and help guide us, um, all of us through our work and including you. Um, so, and just, just the understanding of it, just breaking it down um, through the next slides, I'll go through a little bit more of this in detail. But again, so if, you, if you, this is something that you won't learn today, um, if you haven't had the opportunity to understand what the SPIF is, um, I can probably um, say that I'm about 100% sure that most of us that are on the Zoom meeting, um, it's took us some time to understand and get comfortable with the SPIF. And I learned something just about every time that either we present or somebody else is presenting on the SPIF um, that I take back and then I make for sure that if it's something that I can utilize and help that individual with to, to make it more transparent or understand it. So I take that from other people too and I hope that you do the same so that it's easier for you to grasp what the, the SPIF is. Next slide, please chat. So again, these are just the, the general breakdown steps of the SPIF. Um, it's a natural process, it's data-driven, evidence-based, and is developed and supported by SAMHSA. And it's like a business plan for you. And what I usually tell individuals is, is just think about a, a plan that you had to put into, um, into process. Or um, think about if you had to plan a wedding or you was about to purchase a house or purchase a car or whatever it is. This is a step that we use in our everyday life. And so we try to make for sure that we make it easy as possible for you to understand. Um, and it's very important that each step um, is taking um, through and again, so we'll just make for sure that um, we're all addressing each of these steps um, as we go throughout the year. Um, if there's anything that you do not understand or you need to get more information on, um, we're definitely there to help you um, to understand each step as we go through. Um, for the planning individuals, we know that you'll be starting at the planning stage. Um, and then we have individuals on the call that are starting in the implementation stage. So each stage is very important um, to you as we move through. Chad, you can advance to the next slide, please. Again, this is just a more of a defined definition of the, the breakdown. The assessment, again, is just basically you're looking at the population need, the resources, addressing the gaps, um, the capacity. Do you have the, um, the size or the, the opportunity to mobilize and to address what is out there? The planning stage, again, developing that comprehensive strategic plan, um, implementing um, those evidence-based practices that we talked about earlier um, in the slides that are approved through KDADS and also a team that review those as well. And then of course, the evaluation, the monitoring, evaluating and sustaining what can be improved and replaced um, as we move through. Um, you also see there sustainability and cultural competency. And Chad, you can move on to the next slide there too. And this is an important piece and um, over the last few years, we have really emphasized on uh, sustainability and also as well cultural competency. So what we have been informing people that we don't wanna wait until um, you're at the end of year three, year four, and not just with um, KPICI, but whatever grant um, that you're able to um, receive, that you start planning sustainability at the time um, that you have received that grant. And I was just thinking last night, um, even at the time that you are planning or you applying for um, that grant or whatever it may be, um, you start putting sustainability um, in your plan while you're, while you're actually filling out the application um, and start having that in place. And this is something that we would address throughout the year. Um, and it's something that you'll hear um, or you'll be welcome to attend uh, meetings if you're not 
um, engage with this um, training, but we have the trainings around sustainability and cultural competency as well. And this is another piece that we have, and I think you received some training from um, Wichita State on this as well, coming up pretty soon. And we also do another little short time training um, in February around um, cultural competency. And as you see that, that is in the middle of the pinwheel or the circle. And what I learned uh, coming in about four or five years ago is that you can see that sustainability and cultural competency is, is that little white piece that is like saturated throughout every stage and then vice versa with every other stage, you can see how they intertwine. So every step of the SPIF is important to each other. So they support one another as we go through. You can move on to the next slide, please, Chad. Um, and as, as, I, as I close and I move this on to my coworker, uh, Lindsay, again, just don't want you to feel over um, processed with the, uh, the SPIF. Um, I enjoy learning it. Like I said, I definitely share this with, with my family, friends, um, even coworkers um, at KDADS. Um, we have um, established a, uh, a, um, a training where um, our supervisor, Stephanie, and I believe Chad as well, um, had started working with um, KDADS and I believe also DCF, uh, showing them how the SPIF can be an important asset to their work. So it's not just really um, engaged with the work that we do, but it can be saturated throughout work that you may be engaged outside of this um, KPICI. And again, I thank you for your time. And I'm going to turn it over to um, Lindsay um, regarding to our reporting requirements. Good morning, everyone. I'm so glad to be here. I don't know if you know, again, my name is Lindsay Spooner Golden. I joined the prevention team back in March of this year. And um, I just want to tell you a little bit about our reporting requirements. Um, there's a lot of things we'll be going over this afternoon, but Let's talk about community chat box a little bit. Chat, can you advance to the next slide? Yeah, I will. Um, Lindsay, it, sound, it seems like the audio is a little bit choppy when you when you're speaking, and so I'm sorry about that. But um, I think I'll see what I can do on my end. But on your end, if you're able to. It just if you speak a little bit slowly, I think it will catch the words since we're catching every sure. other word. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Chad. Yeah. So the community checkbox, yeah, here we go. The community checkbox is a web-based recording and measurement and kind of reporting tool for your community work. It helps you document your efforts and share success stories with the funders and other stakeholders. It also makes it easy to kind of highlight your accomplishments and sh share uh, your story more well documented. So we'll go over uh, the community checkbox in depth this afternoon. So uh, let's advance to the next slide. I believe everyone is familiar with the KCDC Kansas Communities That Care Student Survey. This survey measures uh, teen substance abuse, delinquency, and related problem behaviors in schools and community. And our goal is to have 60% of eligible students complete this uh, survey. Next slide. So what is an appropriate signature on your documents? Our documents are going to require you to print out the PDF, sign it, scan it, and return it to, uh, to your prevention uh, consultant here at KDADS. Next slide. These fiscal reports are due by the 10th of every month. Um, and, and we understand that, that things happen and 
um, you know, it's hard to, that we have obstacles. So we do understand that. So we, there is a little bit of leniency. But again, we need to be in communication with you, you know, before the deadline. Each of uh, you coalitions will receive the same spreadsheet, but it is personalized just for your coalition. And it is the way that we reimburse your monthly expenses. Next slide. This is what the financial or the fiscal report will look like um, that you'll fill out every, um, every month. Obviously, um, it's pretty self-explanatory. Whatever you enter in um, this upper part here uh, is automatically populated um, in the lower part of this document. And uh, it keeps a running total of, of where you're at. Because this document is uh, auto-populating and does its own calculations, we ask that you don't change or adjust the document in any way. Next slide. In addition to the fiscal report, each month you'll need to complete the supplemental form. The form correlates with the fiscal report, and it just provides space for an explanation of the expenditures on your monthly fiscal report. Next slide. In addition to your fiscal report and the supplemental form, there are quarterly progress reports. Um, obviously, these are due July 1 through September 30th. And, and you'll get more information about what's required uh, in your report as we move forward in the process. Next slide. So it's incredibly important for you to Ask questions. If you if you don't know, ask questions. Uh, this is a new process for everyone, and we want to make sure that you get started on the right foot. Also, you need to turn in both of your forms every month. That is the fiscal report and the supplemental form. Make sure you're just keeping an eye on your budgeting balances. If you have questions about shuffling uh, line items, if there are more expenses than you uh, anticipated, that's something that you just need to keep in contact with us. And, and like I said, just make sure that you are asking questions on things you don't know. You have to make sure that we sign each fiscal report each month. And that is the authorized signator. So you, you probably know who that is already in your uh, in your coalition, so uh, we need to make sure that those get signed so that everything does get processed and you do get reimbursed in a timely manner. The things you need to remember are do not <laughs> manipulate the forms. It does um, cause problems with the calculations. Once you've turned in a form for October, you cannot go back in December and, and change that form in any way. We need to keep a, a running total um, correctly. And then again, don't feel embarrassed to ask questions. Don't feel like uh, you know, you're the only one that doesn't know because this is a new process for you and there's a lot to learn. So just remember to ask questions and stay in contact with, you know, with the prevention team. And I think that everyone will be great. Get off mute here. Before we go on, uh, look, do you want to take an opportunity to ask any questions about what was just covered with from Chris or Lindsay or Stephanie? Do the grantees have any questions about the fiscal, um, anything you want to bring up now before we move on? This is Robin Griffin from Fire Island County. I had a quick question about acceptable signatures. Um, what I heard was that you print it off and then sign it and scan it in, but what if you have the capability for a stylus on your um, computer, would that be acceptable to send in? 
yes, that is acceptable as, as long as it is a signature that that is acceptable. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Okay. Again, don't hesitate to ask, as Lindsay was saying. So now we're going to transition just a bit. Um, how many, you know, we, we make some assumptions that people know about um, things. Um, so I would like to know from our grantees, if you can physically just raise your hand, I'll look, scroll through the picture. How many of you, or if you put in the chat, have used or are familiar with the Kansas Community Care Student Survey or have used or know how to find your county data? Joe said yes. Whoops. What happened to my, there we go. Gabrielle, okay. Terry, great. Good, good. All right. That is good to know. Okay. Chad? We're going to go ahead and, and just as a refresher, use this tool. This is a tool you can share with your communities and your parents and your boards. Uh, rather than trying to explain what it is and the purpose and why it's used, this is a great tool for you to use. So we're going to review the video related to the KCTC and then we'll talk a little bit more about it and, and how you get the data. We see their faces every day. We're by their side as they succeed and sometimes struggle at school. But how well do we really know our students? What about what goes on outside of school? How do we know how to help them if we don't have a full picture of their challenges, as well as the positive influences in their lives? In Kansas, we're fortunate to have a powerful tool for measuring students' attitudes, thoughts, and behaviors. This valuable window into student life is called the Kansas Communities That Care Student Survey. They're not really willing to share a whole lot in class. I think that the survey is a great opportunity for the kids to feel safe in an environment, to sh really share how they feel, and for us as educators to get some really great feedback on things that maybe we're doing well and maybe some things that we need to work on a little bit better. The surveys to me are valuable because they give you the perception of the youth. We're not asking adults, we're asking the students themselves how they feel about the different substances or problematic behaviors. Since 1995, the Southeast Kansas Education Service Center at Greenbush has administered this nationally recognized comprehensive survey free to Kansas schools on behalf of the Kansas Department for Aging and Disability services. Given to 6th, 8th, 10th, and 12th graders, the survey looks at four areas of students' lives, school, community, family, and peers. It monitors adolescent problem behaviors and the environmental factors that put young people at risk or protect them from developing those behaviors. It's nice to have the data for our coalition, for our community. Our problems are different than they are in Kansas City or Wichita or Topeka. So it's nice to have that data to relate directly to our communities. Schools like yours and others who help children rely on the survey to plan programs and activities and secure funding. As a building administrator, we take this data and we share the data with our staff, with our parents, with our site council, and with our safe and supportive schools committee. And with all those different groups, we collaborate in trying to look at the data and saying what are the needs of our students. The staff at Greenbush provides year-round assistance at no charge, including website training, data analysis, customized reports, and guidance in using the information in your school. It's important that we as schools take this type of surveys for data collection. We know today it's all about data and so many of our schools and communities rely on some grant funding, particularly in the areas of safety, bullying, and drug and other prevention use. Unlike other student surveys, the KCTC is annual making it easy to track trends and Kansas was one of the first states to administer the survey. It was carefully designed and research based for valid and reliable results. It has publicly available state and county data and password protected district and building data. The information is easy to access and use. And the survey has high rates of participation, something state prevention providers are working hard to maintain. Today our schools are always strapped for money and we're also looking at how that we can maximize our students' potential. We know that this is a tool that has a long track record of building data that is, can be then compared not only within our own building, but with our district, our county, and the state. 
The survey is also more comprehensive than most. You can find out answers to specific questions, monitor progress in certain areas, and even discover problems you were unaware of, such as the spike in prescription drug use or bullying. You'll find many uses for this important anonymously provided information, including needs assessment, targeting resources, evaluating the success of programs, applying for grants, reporting, and PR and outreach. The data and reports are extremely useful to us. We use it in grant writing, grant reporting. We just received a major drug-free communities federal grant because our school district takes the CTC survey. That's their measurement. And Greenbush, we work with them to customize the data and reports for our needs. The survey looks at both negative and positive factors in students' lives. With all the time pressures on schools, why is it important to find out this information? Because research shows there's a direct correlation between these risk and protective factors and academic performance, including state assessments. Using reliable, current data, schools can channel their efforts into reducing risk factors and boosting protective factors. Education changes and evolves all the time, but one thing is always true. Your time and resources are limited. This survey is a useful tool to help you with annual assessment, evaluation, and strategic planning. If you talk to uh, most schools, they, they are not afraid to invest money in scouting football teams to see what the other team is doing. They aren't afraid of checking on their own data, and their own players on the 40 time, their bench press. They have no idea what their behaviors are outside of school with alcohol, drugs, bullying. Here's an opportunity for free, it doesn't cost a dime, to be able to look at what's happening with things that are going to directly affect these kids' lives that are going to have much more impact on their life than their bench press. If you haven't given the survey in your district, or have but didn't know how to put the results to use for you and your students, please contact the team at Greenbush. If you have, thank you. On behalf of all the students and families who have been helped, when our young people get the support they need, the entire community benefits. Your participation is critical. Our schools make this survey possible. We hope you'll help keep this valuable resource going strong. For more information or to register, go to kctcdata.org. Thank you. And like I said, that's a really good resource to have available to use, to look at, to share, to show. It does a great job of explaining. So you don't have to be the expert on the KCTC. You can always refer others to watch the, to the link of the video. Um, go on to the next slide, please, Chad. So just to reiterate, there was a lot of information there, just some things to remember. The survey is funded by KDANS, uh, and it's been administered since 1994. So we have 26, 27 years of, of annual data, which is, which is really phenomenal uh, for our state. Uh, it's available free of charge to all school districts, both public and private. And it focuses on students in sixth and eighth and 10th and 12th grade to kind of get a middle school snapshot and a high school snapshot. As a grantee, the goal for your county is to have 60% or more um, participation in each, in each school district, which means really 60% across the county. And to represent your county well, you need to have participation from um, hopefully all school districts. Okay, so you move on, Chad. So we have um, the website, kctcdata.org. And if you haven't been on recently, it'll have a different look than what you may have seen before. We have just updated the website. Uh, now under Kansas Communities of Care, we have three surveys that are, that are KDAD surveys. There's the student survey, there's a young adult survey, and a gambling survey. So when you go into the new website, again at kctcdata.org, you'll click on student survey on the left. Next slide. And when you do, you'll have options to select up on, on the upper left, select by your county or your state. Um, you can look at, um, right, thank you. Uh, and then I, I think if you click one more time, there's an animation, Chad. There we go. That is where you would want to go to look at different categories. So that's a pull down that shows if you wanted to look at questions related to alcohol, if you wanted to look at questions related to tobacco, or you might want to look at e-cigarettes, uh, anything within each of the four domains, that's where you go to pull down to select what you want to look at. And then on the right is where 
the actual questions are that you would, would you would click on. So if I clicked on alcohol, I can see over on the blue, there's lifetime use, 30 day prevalence, binge drinking, scrolling down, there's all the questions that you'd want to look at. So you can select what you want. Uh, okay, next slide. So let's say I looked, clicked on the 30 day alcohol, past 30 day alcohol. This is what I would get if I was looking at my county in light blue, it compares to the state in a darker blue. So you can see how you're doing over time. You can set your date range. So here we are showing five years, but you can go back, clear back to 1994 if your county has data from then. So there's lots of di different options, but I did want you to see what it looks like to compare and to look at trends over time. Next slide. Okay, and go ahead and click again. So a couple of important things for, that you're gonna to wanna to look at as you're starting your, uh, to look at data. One is participation rates. These are important to monitor over time. This is where you're gonna see by overall and by grade how your county is doing in terms of eligible students that have participated. Again, we want participation to be as high as possible for the highest quality data that we can get. Um, and it will also show you a breakdown by grade. It will show you trends over time to see if your participation, if you're trying to compare last year to this year, it's important to have, if possible, similar participation rates so that you can have confidence in your data. Okay, next click. 30-day substance use is kind of a, a neat new feature that we did that you can click on that'll show all of your substance use in one graph. Go on to the next slide. If you click on that, this is what you'll see for your county. It'll rank order substance use in the highest prevalence reported. So we can easily see that for this particular county, alcohol, as is most counties, is the uh, highest use for students. Uh, next is e-cigarettes. Um, which is uh, sometimes it's, it's either a cigarette, sometimes it's marijuana. So this will allow you in one snapshot, be able to look at your substance use um, for your county. And that's kind of a new feature that we added to this uh, version of the website. So I wanted you to, to kind of know where that's at and be able to access it easier. You don't have to click on each one of these things. It'll have it all in one chart, which is um, an, a new uh, user-friendly feature. Next slide. Another fun feature with the new website is for every single question in the survey, you can select, you can, there's a place where you can look at a county, uh, county map and this can kind of provide you a hotspot map. So you can see where your county lies following the legend on the bottom. You can see uh, where your county lies in, in, in a particular, for example, 30 day substance use. If I'm in the dark blue, uh, I can see kind of what's around me. I can click on the counties around me. And if you click on one of the counties, it actually brings up a pop-up when you, that shows you data for the past five years and compares to the state value. So that's another neat feature that makes it easier to do some of the work, some of the assessment that we're going to be doing. Okay, next slide. So, you know, we kind of briefly touched on the KCTC data and the new website, but really why is this important? Why do you need data? And why is the goal 60% of all eligible students are higher? Well, data is important throughout the whole strategic prevention framework, throughout the whole SPIF process, but we focus our attention particularly during the assessment, implementation, and evaluation steps of the SPIF. So during assessment, we're gonna look at the areas, we're gonna have a data review for your county. We'll provide you with some data, some ways to, like we did before rank order, look at your risk protective factors, uh, help you be able to prioritize and address uh, the problems that you're seeing, um, that you're prioritizing. Looking at, again, again, the risk factors that are driving, for example, underage drinking or e-cigarette or marijuana use. Uh, there's going to be a training in September where we're, so that'll be coming up, where we're really going to be looking, assessing, and using data to assess. So it's important if you're going to be using data for these important decisions, like priorities for your grant or for your, for your county, that you have good, high quality data that you have confidence in. So that's why we're stressing the need for 60% or higher. 
Also during implementation, you're going to want to know what's what's working and what's not working. If something's not working, how do we improve? Well, how do we know what's working or not if we don't have some data or information to look at? Um, so that's important during implementation. There'll be data collected along with information from the community checkbox. We'll be looking at outcomes, some pre and po potentially pre and post data on some particular uh, strategies. So during implementation, data is very important. And then obviously for evaluation. Were we successful in reaching our goals and our targets, and our, our objectives that we set? We're going to be setting objectives that we want to see a, a percentage reduction, for example, in substance use. Well, we need the data to show whether we're reaching those goals or not. So, it, so it is very important. Next slide. Just as an FYI, this is the 2020 uh, KCTC County Participation Map. So you can see again, um, the dark green is the highest participation where they've had 80 to 100% of all eligible students. The darker blue is 60 to 80%. Uh, the lighter blue, 40 to 60. The yellow, 25 to 40. And the white are counties that have less than 25% of eligible students participating. So we don't have, we don't display data for, for those purposes. But I show this to show you that um, the majority of counties and the majority of school districts across the state are participating in the survey. KSDE has officially recommended that school districts um, administer the survey. So that's a that's a big uh, that's a big draw for school districts. We you know they want to typically want to do what uh, the state board of education recommends. So that makes it easier and will make it easier to. Um, get schools on board, but you can see where your county falls and, and maybe where what you need to do to um, potentially improve participation if needed. I think the thing I like about this too is it really shows that it is a statewide, it's not just focusing on one pocket of the state, it has, there's a nice distribution of participation across the state. Okay, Chad, next slide. So what if my community doesn't have data, doesn't have good participation? Um, how do I do that? How can I improve that since that's one of the one of the goals of this grant? If you don't have at least 60% participation in your county, we will help you and we'll help you uh, prepare a KCTC participation action plan. But basically it's just going to go through um, the process and line out some steps of how you're going to, you know, who you're going to talk to, how you're going to um, what actions you're going to take to increase participation. You know, that, and with, you know, as I said, your, your KPC support team will help you with that. Okay, next slide. Um, so one thing that part of that action plan if needed, and even if it's not needed, it's a good idea to send a letter to the school districts in your county from the coalition on coalition <laughs> that talks about the grant um, and how you're using the data for improvements and for funding and um, how their participation is appreciated and helpful. Uh, you can schedule a meeting, you know, send the letter. You can also schedule a meeting to talk with school administrators. Next, um, have again, view the KCTC video, send them the link, say, hey, look at this. This is, this is what we're talking about. This is uh, what we need to make sure that you're doing. And then it's really, really important to have school representatives on your coalition. Um, they're members of the community, important members of the community, and they're um, invaluable liaison between your coalition and the school. So it's important to have um, one or certainly more school representatives. And then you can discuss how the KCTC data is really benefits schools to participate. The superintendent has to agree to administer the survey. So you can talk to the superintendent and again, we'll have provide you supports for doing this on how the data is used from uh, to promote social emotional learning and improve school climate, things that the districts are very, very interested in. Uh, so again, we can work with you on that. Next slide. So there's also, um, one of the things we have, the superintendent has to register and agree to do it. Then we also have active consent where parents have to agree um, for their students to participate. So that's some additional work to make sure parents are aware of what the data is used for, why it's important, 
you know, how it's, how it's valuable. The one way to get these parent consents that we found is the most um, easiest way to do that is to make sure the consent forms are in their enrollment packets. That's the number one best way to get a high participation, high consent forms. Um, if that doesn't happen, so I would, I would work with schools and just come and contact them and say, hey, you know, um, if you're planning to do the survey, it's time to make sure that the, your forms are in the enrollment packet. Have you done that yet? Depends on, and then also, if not, you know, you can send out a form two weeks before the survey date and informing parents and asking them to return. Um, and you can also send out, the schools can send out email, text, or voice alerts reminding parents that they need to get the forms in. But hands down, the number one way is, is helping schools get that in the enrollment packet. So on the KCTC um, tile uh, at the top, go ahead and click Chad. A couple things I just wanted to point out. There's an about the survey uh, button that talks about the purpose and the design of the survey. If you click on that and it'll talk about frequently asked questions. It, well, it, this is where you would send someone to view the survey to actually see the questions that are asked in the survey is from the about button. The resources button has uh, is where you'll find the video and I think we'll show you that here a little bit. Registration, you can see there's uh, parent information. Um, go ahead and click Chad. There we go. That's where you'll, uh, that's where the video is. You, that is a link. If you just click on that learn more about that sentence, that'll take, to the, to take you to the video that you just saw that you can um, um, tell people where to find that. And then there's also, you know, the parent consent letter that we said was very important to get in the enrollment packet, that's on here, along with survey administration information um, and so forth. So we're gonna spend some time on KCTC uh, coming up in assessment and talk a little bit more about it, but this gives you a sneak peek and a preview, especially of the new website if you have not been on here but it provides a very important uh, outcome data for your grant. Um, before we uh, move on, I think we're about ready for a break, but before we do, are there any questions um, about the information I just shared? Okay, next slide, Chad. Thank you very much. All right, thank you, Lisa. That's good. And yeah, so it's a good morning. We're about an hour in, so we're gonna take a five minute break. Um, please go take care of yourself and anything that you need to do, come back. We're gonna start back up at 11.10 and go for another 50 minutes or so. So see you all in five minutes. Come back. All righty, well, thanks, Chad. Um, I think the screens will pop up on the slide here in just a minute and then we'll get started. Um, I know we're throwing a lot of information at you um, today, but I do just want you to keep in mind that um, the KPC team is here to support you. Um, everyone has a community sports specialist as well that can um, help guide you through some of these deliverables um, because it is a lot to take in. So if at the end of today, if you're still um, maybe struggling with questions, please reach out and we're happy to help. Um, I know it is a lot of information um, initially anyway. So we're going to talk a little bit about capacity now. Um, Lisa shared a lot of information with you about the, the KCTC data and that's just one aspect of the assessment piece you'll be doing. Another component is assessing the capacity of your community and also the capacity of your coalition. When we talk about the capacity of your community, this is really the community's readiness to address some of the issues you've identified and then mobilize for community change. Um, this will be done by conduct conducting community readiness interviews and we'll talk about that um, during the September 9th training. Uh, you'll learn more about that process. But today we're gonna talk about building the capacity of the coalition. So some grantees who've been on the call, I know I believe Reno is on um, you likely already have some experience with the coalition capacity survey. Um, essentially what the sur capacity survey does is really look at your coalition's needs um, and how you can build the capacity of your coalition to be ready to address some of these issues. The coalition capacity survey will also help identify areas of growth for your coalition as well. If we move to the next slide, we're going to actually talk about what the coalition capacity survey looks like. What you're seeing on the screen is a screenshot um, of the online survey. 
Greenbush will be providing a link that you'll send out to your members. And we'll discuss more about this on another slide going forward. Next slide, please. The Coalition Capacity Survey is a tool to measure all the aspects of the Coalition's ability to plan and implement prevention strategies. So it's really a crucial component of your work, especially if you're a new coalition starting up. This will give you a really good baseline of the things that you need to be able to provide to your coalition so you can be successful. If you're a long-term coalition, it also helps you get an idea of where your coalition's at and what those areas for strength might be. So this survey measures multiple aspects of the coalition's um, readiness and ability to prepare for prevention work. The tool is divided into seven different sections, which you can see on the screen. These include a mission, vision, and goals, projects, sense of community, communication, coalition meetings, membership and participation, management, cultural competency, and training needs. This survey will identify different areas of strength and then different areas for improvement for your coalition. Next slide, please. So let's talk a little bit about process here. So the process for admitting the survey and collecting the data is shown on the screen and we'll provide that to you as well in some follow-up. So at the end of the day today, Greenbush will be sending your coalition a survey link. So the end of the day, and Lisa, I might ask for some clarification here. Today, the links will only go to planning grantees, correct? So if you are a new implementation grantee um, or a, a previous implementation grantee, your survey link may not come today, but it will come soon. Lisa, can you clarify what the process might be for grantees who are not planning grantees? So they, they should be going out um, in either today or tomorrow as well. I mean, I think everything's ready. Everything so. ready. Okay. But we're focusing on the planning grant, the new grantees here for today. Okay. okay. But the so others, if the others will, will be coming, I would say very soon. Okay. So if you're not a planning grantee, expect your, your link later this week, but planning grantees, you can expect yours today. So when you receive this link, you will forward this link to all of your coalition members. And we'd like you to do that by July 24th, which I believe is Friday. So if by Friday, please forward this link to all of your coalition members. It's really important to send this to as many coalition members as possible so you can get a really good comprehensive look at your coalition. On July 31st, which is about a week after um, the survey has been sent, Greenbush will provide an update to you about the number of surveys that have been completed. At that point, if you only have a few, this would be a good time for you to resend that link and remind coalition members about the, the value and importance of participation. It's not a very lengthy survey. Um, it will, it'll take less than probably seven minutes to complete in total. Um, it's really a quick click through, so it's not a huge burden of time and it's all online. If we continue to the next slide, we can see uh, more about the process. The survey will close on August 7th, so it's open for about two and a half weeks. About a month later, on September 8th, Greenbush will provide the results to you um, in a report. That'll be on September 8th. So you will get that report, and you'll want to have that report with you for the training scheduled for September 9th. So on September 9th, we have assessment and capacity building training scheduled, and so you'll bring that um, report with you, and we'll learn more about it. Um, we'll walk through what that survey means, what it looks like, but it'll give you at least a day to kind of look at it, familiarize yourself with it, and see if you have any questions in particular. And it might be good if you're a paper person like me to go ahead and, and print it off and have it with you for the training, even though the training's virtual. It's nice to reference it so you won't have to be flipping between screens. Go ahead and print that off and have it ready to, to go through. Yes, that's a great point. Thank you, Lisa. I, I like paper too. <laughs> I, have, I have my paper here, so it's good to have. Um, if you are a previous grantee, um, you'll use your new report to reassess and update your capacity building plans. But for your, your new planning grantees, you will just use these reports as your baseline data. Let's move on to the next slide. What you're seeing on the screen now is a copy of what the Coalition Capacity Survey report will look like. Greenbush will provide the survey report to you and it will be personalized with your coalition name. These reports will also be placed under your folder on the workstation, so you'll be able to access those um, whenever you need them. Um, if you're a prior grantee who's completed these already, they will be on your folder on the workstation. Next slide, thank you. 
So the report will provide the results of the survey answers in a matrix as shown on the screen for each dimension. So what we're looking at here is the vision, mission, and goals section. The last column is what you're going to want to pay close attention to. This column says responding three and four, and this is the data you'll use to complete the capacity building plan. You'll see that some areas in here um, scores rank the same, and I believe on the next slide we'll talk a little bit about what we can do in that scenario. So let's move on to the next slide here. Okay, so on this slide, oh goodness. Sorry, my screen froze up here. There we go. Uh, for previous grantees that have results from last year's coalition capacity survey, you'll see two columns. And so on the screen, you see the response three or four for 2018, and then the response three or four for 2017. One of these, the, so this will allow you to easily assess and compare results from year to year, essentially which is convenient for when you're planning. But those initial planning grantees, you will just have the first year of that uh, response three or four. Let's move on to the next slide. What you're seeing on the screen here is a copy of what the capacity building plan looks like. Um, each of the new planning grantees should have received a guidance manual. And if you'll flip to page 75, I believe, Yes, on page 75, you'll be able to see uh, the sample document of what the capacity building resource document looks like. So the capacity building plan is an eight page document that will include assessing and planning for building the capacity of the coalition and the readiness of the community. It also includes two work plans for actions the coalition will take to increase capacity in both areas. So for new grantees, you'll receive additional training on the capacity building um, plan in September during the assessment capacity training. And previous grantees, you will just be updating this document. And again, that is something your community support specialist can help you with if you have questions about how to make those updates, um, can definitely help you do that. Moving on to the next slide here. This is a, another page within the coalition capacity document. The coalition survey results from the years column for 2020 labeled response, responding three and four will, will be placed here for each dimension. So if you remember previously, there were a bunch of scores. You'll pick the highest and the lowest here. So for example, on the, the previous document, there was, I think, three scores that were like 80.2 or something like that. At that point, you can determine which one you want to pick as the highest or the lowest for you to work on for your capacity building plan. When you have this sheet in front of you, this will help you easily identify stronger and weaker areas of your coalition capacity, which then can help you direct some actions to build that capacity of your coalition. And I believe that is all we have for this piece here at this point. So I know we went through that pretty quickly, but it is a pretty easy survey to complete. Again, the link will be sent to you later today for planning grantees and by the end of the week for the other grantees. So do you have particular questions about how to complete the coalition capacity survey? Okay, if not, I will close and hand it off to Dola, I believe. Good afternoon, again. well, not quite afternoon, almost. So oh, good morning again. We're just gonna give you a brief uh, review of the community checkbox. And like I stated earlier this afternoon, we'll get into actual training in the form. So Chad, next slide, please. Um, these are, this is the agenda that we'll go over this afternoon. Right now, we'll just review uh, some of the beginning uh, parts of the actual community checkbox. Next slide, please. And next slide. Well, I will say, um, would you go back? I will say here that you'll hear us uh, mentioning the uh, uh, community checkbox and the workstation. They are both uh, in the same URL. It's um, myctb.org. My and most of you should have gotten a um, new users, should have received an email uh, getting you access into the checkbox. So if you had any um, challenges or you are not into the community checkbox, um, 
during our break, um, over that hour break would be a good time to make sure that you gain access uh, and then also to respond and let me know um, if there's some if there's some other assistance I can give to you. The workstation chat we'll talk about earlier, but it's our communication system for the KPC collaborative and the checkbox is the evaluation system. Thank you, Chad. When you uh, gain entry, uh, you'll select the Kansas Prevention Collaborative. That box does not stay in the same place. I'm sorry, you'll kind of have to hunt for it every now and again. And that just means we have progress going on at KU. So uh, be patient with us. Uh, when you sign in, you can save your sign in and, and we'll talk about all of that later. But I do want to warn you that that doesn't stay in the same place. It does remain named the same thing though. Next slide. This is the landing page um, of the community checkbox. When you uh, first sign in, you'll see, you'll see all of this. Uh, you guys are, of course, in the KPIC collaboratory. The other collaboratories are other um, grantees uh, through KDAS who have access for their own uh, funding. So you guys are the KPIC collaboratory. And when you select that collaboratory, it brings you to the landing page of the workstation. So this is the workstation. This is the communication hub. And each behind each of those icons that where it says KPIC deliverable templates or and KP, KPIC resource documents, KPC training materials, each of those will have um, folders and files, just like a filing system or your, um, your Microsoft um, common template for filing, uh, for filing, uh, for filing, excuse me, will be behind those. And I'll just go over each one of those briefly, but the KPIC deliverable templates will be all of the forms that are required um, by KDADS for you to complete. Thank you, Chad. They are Word documents. And when you complete, what you'll do is open the, the, um, the icon. Behind the icon will be each Word document. You will download that Word document to your computer, save it as a name for your community. And then Chad, if you would go over to the right, Yes. <laughs> when you complete um, that actual form, then you will upload it to your community. I will warn you again, uh, due to access, if you are, let's see, Wyandotte County or the, a planning grantee, I'll just use the Planning Grantee Youth Achievement Center. The only thing that you will see in that list is planning cohort five documents and your link. And that's true for each community. You will only see the cohort that you are in and your link. So you won't have the opportunity to upload it to the wrong uh, document link. You will, um, you'll have access to that particular document link. And that's where all of your uploaded um, deliverables will go. The KPIC resource documents are just what it says. Um, and Lisa talked about the KCTC earlier. There's a resource document for uh, different things you want to use to reach out to superintendents. Um, when we talk about the community checkbox, we'll talk about participant description where you'll be uh, gathering information just like you did, um, just like you did in the Google document. Uh, that Chad had earlier where we'll all put in our demographic information. We'll have a resource document there for you as well. And all of this will be um, gone into uh, in a much deeper way for you as we continue our training. Um, the KPIC training materials. Um, so after this training is complete and other trainings that you'll engage in going forward, you'll be able to go back and review uh, the training materials. Um, the grantee tips, tools, and resources is like a blog. So uh, for me, um, if I see something that everybody is having an issue with, I'll 
type in that blog, you know, just something that everybody can get at the same time. Uh, that way when uh, using email, I might miss somebody, but your access will give you uh, the opportunity to be able to see everything at the same time. Uh, each of you will have that access so that, you know, when we're saying, hey, um, you know, God forbid, there's an issue with the CCB, we'll be able to put that information in there for you. Um, KCT resources is sort of a pull out from the um, icon above, the KPICI resource documents is specific to resources related to the KCT, KCTC. Uh, the discussion board is something that I encourage you to use. It's like your frequently used um, answers or questions space. Um, more than likely, if you have a question, someone else uh, is looking for the same answer. And certainly when we respond again, it's an opportunity for everybody to gain and learn that information at the same time. Um, one thing I didn't ask for from the new planning and new implementation grantees is for your social media links. And so behind that icon, pardon me, you'll find social media links, um, Facebook and Twitter specifically, and um, your website links can be found there. And that's an opportunity for you to learn from each other, some of you will be addressing some of the same risk and protective factors in your communities, and you may have the occasion to use the same um, strategies. Um, and you just might want to see, well, how is someone, someone else, how is another community implementing um, It Matters, the It Matters campaign, for an example? And so you'll be able to go there uh, to get that information. The KPICI calendar is specific to, um, to dates and schedules related to KPICI. The prevention, um, uh, the prevention website has a calendar, but it is for the whole um, KPC collaborative outside of what's going on with KDADS. So this calendar will tell you when your next training is, um, what is the next, when your next training is for the community checkbox or sense making, uh, when the next BIF training, training is going to occur. So very specific to uh, what's going on in the KPC collaborative. Thank you, Chad. This is the landing page for um, the uh, community checkbox. So what we just uh, viewed were slides of the workstation and you'll see you'll gain access to the KPICI um, CCB. You see the orange box at the top. Chad, if you could continue supporting that, that was great. <laughs> so the, you'll see the link in, when you're actually in the uh, website, it's a blue link and that down arrow will show you the different um, other areas that you have access to. And one of the first ones is the KPICI CCB. This is the landing page for the community checkbox. So um, you'll have lots of acronyms, WST for workstation and CCB for community checkbox. Um, I won't go into each one of these. The ones that will, well, I'll go I'll go into the ones across the top. So the inner data is how it's one way that you'll be able to gain access to the accomplishment form. View data is a complete listing of all of the accomplishments in the community checkbox. So you'll be able to see um, accomplishments entered by other communities, which is another great way to learn uh, what Chad is circling now. It's just a quick capture <coughs> of the first, um, I think it's less than 10 entries that are in the checkbox. It's just a dashboard. Um, it's just a dashboard view. Uh, graphs, based on all of the data that is entered into the community checkbox. And by data, I do, I'm still referring to accomplishments. You are able to graph. So I mentioned the accomplishment form. So just about every question 
in the form has the opportunity um, to create a graph so you're able to tell your community story. Um, that is all that I'm going to cover on this particular slide. Thank you, Chad. This is a broader view of the accomplishments uh, that are entered in the community checkbox. And this is, the, this is one of the views. So this is the view that KU has set as a standard. You can uh, change that view to be um, whatever it is that you would like to see for your community. And that is another feature um, you're gonna hear me say, and training is coming, it's the truth. And training is coming. But you'll be able to reset this um, uh, in a way that, that is more useful for your community. So you'll have the date, um, your name, your organization name, a description, and what's the phase. And we think this is a good um, sort of view if you want to see what other communities are doing. Again, uh, you have the opportunity to view those entries. Um, but of course you would only uh, change and edit the entries that are related to your community. And Chad, we can go to the next slide. Um, three things I want to point out, um, just about every question is required uh, in the community checkbox and that's noted by the asterisk after each question. That is so that we know that you didn't accidentally skip a question. So we're not, you know, trying to figure out, you know, did they really mean to answer the question? And because of that, we also um, have usually other or NA as an option. So um, you'll get the hang of it. It's a little cumbersome at first, but that's pretty intuitive. There's also a question mark um, after most of the responses and that's additional help. So, you know, if you're entering after hours or at odd times um, or at a time when maybe someone is one, either uh, any of the contractors aren't available to provide help to you, we have additional information there uh, behind those check boxes. I'm sorry, behind the question marks. Chad, we can move to the next slide. Let's see. I think that this is getting into our afternoon. Can you show me the next slide, Chad? Or I'm just, okay, go back again, please. So um, in the observer, when you open up the accomplishment form, um, you'll have the observer, which will be the first one. That question will remain one. Uh, the next question or the next opportunity to enter information will be the date. And we encourage you to use the calendar icon. Uh, if you have had an opportunity to kind of peruse around in it, you'll see that we have added uh, your names, and specifically I'm speaking to the new grantees, uh, your name has been entered. And what will happen is as you begin typing your name, it, your name will roll up. There's a exhaustive list of users there. And due to uh, fidelity with our data, we don't remove user names. And so when I promise that you won't have to go through the whole list, when you begin typing your name, it'll roll up. Um, your initiative is always going to be K picky. You don't have an opportunity to change that there. And so you are K picky grantees. And I don't think we have anyone who's dually in K picky or PFS, but just in case we do, we don't. Did I see Chrissy shake her head? No. Okay, great. So I won't even say it. Thank you, Chrissy. And we can go to the next slide. Um, so new planning grantees, uh, one of the things we want to point out is that you are a planning grant. There are several options there, as you see. If you look at the bottom when that question is, an is being answered, thank you, Chad, it gives you the option for implementation grant or planning grant. Um, 
you guys are going to be planning grantees. And of course, if you're an implementation grantee, that is going to be what you would select. I'm going to pause here because I think we're into the afternoon slides. Do you agree, Chad? Yeah, we are a little bit, okay. but um, it's Do you want me to go ahead? To, I can continue. Yeah, if you go ahead, we could um, potentially finish a little bit earlier this okay. afternoon. Um, and that way we'll still gear toward a 12 o'clock break for lunch. Okay, great. And you just tell me when you're ready to break and I'll okay. continue then. All right. Sounds okay, good. Thank so you, we are into, I have to get my mind together. We're into the afternoon training. We're going to be talking about the accomplishment form. That's what we're doing now. So um, as I stated earlier, you guys are either an implementation grantee or a planning grantee. Uh, in the middle there, that arrow, you'll see um, community work funded by other grants. If you happen to have um, other um, work that is going on in your community that's funded by other grants and you would like to uh, enter data or accomplishments into the community checkbox. If you would let me know the name of those grants, we would, um, you have the opportunity to, to enter that data. Um, if you are a previous grantee, you'll enjoy this update that if you select other or NA, you'll, the, uh, the, um, the NA options will, will come up but it removes the spiff phase question. And that was a little confusing uh, previously. So that's for previous grantees and not the new um, planning or the new implementation grantees. So that's an update that I think previous grantees will be happy about. And we can go to the next. If you guys have questions, if I'm, please be sure and ask in the chat. Um, just like your uh, username, your organization name is the same way because of fidelity to uh, data, we don't remove um, organization names. And so, and it's really important. I noticed um, we had a returning grantee that if we're not going to use um, the same grant, the same coalition name that you let us know that so we don't have two sets of data for your county or your coalition. Um, if you sent us a name that is actually the fiscal agent, please let us know that. Um, it is really important that we have your correct uh, organization slash coalition name. And again, as you begin typing the name, um, that name will scroll up and you won't have to um, enter that data continuously or each time you enter an accomplishment. Your cohort um, planning grantees for this um, fiscal year are cohort five. And if you are an implementation grantee, you are now, you are cohort four. Is that correct? And that is something that's very important. We'll have some safeguards in there to kind of keep you on track. But the more you understand about who you are, uh, the easier it'll be to give your data uh, back to you. Because we'll have you in there correct. Okay, the next. What counties? Um, that's going to be easy breezy. All of the counties are in there. You'll begin typing your county name. Um, and so that will scroll up as well. What the challenge here is zip codes. So, and especially now since we are uh, mostly doing things from um, outside of our offices, the zip code you would use when you are implementing strategies, if you're not physically at the school implementing a strategy would be the zip code of your coalition. So where your coalition is, um, you know, where your Morgan border is, for, border is for your coalition is the zip code that you will use. Um, and I think that that is the, that would be the biggest question on that as we go along. If there are other questions that come up, um, we'll address those as we go. 
Yes, that's correct. Thank you, Chad. Did your coalition uh, work with others to achieve this accomplish accomplishment? I should have had update on here as well. We simplified this question. Um, working with others uh, outside of a contractor. So if you are in, in the distance, I don't have a good idea of where uh, counties are distant wide. Well, yes, I do. I can use Wyandotte and Johnson. So if you're in Wyandotte County and you worked with um, a coalition in Johnson County, then the answer is yes. And you would just type in the name of that coalition. So if you're Sedgwick and you work with someone with a coalition in Reno County, yes. And it doesn't matter if that, um, if that coalition has funding or not. If you would just type in the name of the coalition, then we'll take it from there. So we want to know um, if you're working with others. And again, when you type yes, you have an opportunity to type in the name of the coalition that you're working for. And that this question is not related to if you worked with Greenbush, KU, WSU, or DECA. And Chad. So this is something that you'll hear over and over and over again. I could probably ask somebody the to just do this slide for me, uh, who's been around for a while, the accomplishment form. The description is should always have these um, attributes in it. Who did it? What did you do? Who did you do it with? For what result or purpose? And that's going to be, uh, in particular, uh, during the assessment time, um, people don't really uh, adhere to this because you're interviewing, you're doing something over and over again. But it's really important that uh, when you're meeting with um, others in the community, when you're implementing a strategy, whatever part of the fifth phase that you're in, that you are accomplishing something, that this is the protocol that you use to enter the description. This um, sets the uh, trajectory for how we are going to code or evaluate your accomplishments. So I have an example here. Um, these are fictitious names. Um, Jessica King would be the who, and what she's doing is attending the KPC orientation. Um, and so yes, while you are in the orientation with lots of other people from other uh, coalitions, you're only entering data about your activity in your coalition. So Alan Johnson uh, is in my Wyandotte coalition, which I didn't state, but um, I attended it with Alan Johnson. And the reason I'm attending is to begin understanding the KPC processes for the 2020 Substance Abuse Prevention Planning Grant. And that is an accomplishment protocol that's like a great example okay <laughs> so we can go to the next slide and I just broke it down a little bit more uh, to give you um, some more reasoning especially as we continue uh, in the training uh, as to why this is really important so you know who did it what did they do why the who was involved you're not going to add uh, that participant description information there but that is something uh, that you are going to want to be cognizant of as you continue answering um, the accomplishment form. And don't forget, when did it occur? So sometimes we get the question, uh, do we have to enter the data on the date it occurs? Um, earlier, I think it was Chris's slide that talked about um, the CCB entries are due every Friday, or if he didn't say it, it's coming up. Um, CCB entries are due every Friday. So it, uh, today is July 21st. You don't necessarily um, have to have the entry in today, but by the end of the week, you would need to have the entry in. And I'm gonna tell you, it's really beneficial to you because it's nothing like trying to comb back through your calendar or your schedule to figure out what happened, 
who was there and, you know, let alone why you attended. <laughs> so uh, we encourage you to uh, enter data, enter your accomplishments often. And Chad, if you could go back a slide, please. That would be great. So that example accomplishment there, it should be the first type of accomplishment that everybody has uh, entered on that's attending the call today. So that's a, that's a great example for your first accomplishment entry in the CCB for today's activity. Okay, and we can go forward again. And again, please. Thank you. Is this entry related to a K-Picky deli deliverable? And again, this is an update for those of you who have been around for a while. It, this used to be the question, is this related to an action item? Um, and while that was helpful, uh, when we began to answer our national outcomes measures uh, reporting, we thought um, this would be better. Uh, because we were missing um, accomplishments related to specific activities. And again, because it's such a fluid thing that you're going to be calling superintendents, you're going to be interviewing people in your community, you know, it's a fluid um, action when you're doing it. So thinking that, oh, this is an accomplishment for the community checkbox um, was not something that was... Um, readily understood, I guess. So to encourage that, we have listed all of the deliverables. So any activity that you are doing to uh, complete a deliverable document is probably something that should be in the accomplishment form or, or should be entered as an accomplishment. So as you begin to um, set appointments with superintendents as you begin to have your community um, interviews. Um, and I don't, uh, just right off the top of my head, any activity that you do that supports your capacity building plan, your data, all of those items that are there uh, should be entries into the community checkbox. Um, and then you select which one. And of course, you know, there's other in NA. If your entry happens not to be regarding one of the deliverables, and an um, example of that would be if you're implementing a strategy. So for planning grantees, uh, you, you won't get there until next year. But if there are any uh, implementation grantees on there, um, if it's about implementing a strategy, more than likely, uh, it's going to be in A when you answer this question. So we'll move on to the next slide. Is this the first time? And so we are at the beginning of a grant period. And again, for those of you who have been around for a while, um, your first couple of entries are going to be for the first time because we're at the beginning of a grant cycle. Uh, for new planning and new uh, implementation grantees, your, um, your first interview related to your um, capacity building, if I'm saying that right, your assessment, your assessment um, documentation, your assessment document, that's going to be your first interview, your first MOU with the school district, anything that's the first time and then you won't have well you could have the first time again when it when the first time you implement a strategy in a community so it sounds sort of uh, simple but we do get a lot of questions and a lot of erroneous uh, entries so i hope i'm not just beating you up on this but the first time is the first time okay there we go all right any questions, let me know. And please, please don't feel bad. Uh, as Chrissy stated earlier, this is a lot of information. And uh, today is July. You probably won't have your first entry until August, or even if it's tomorrow, it's a lot of information. And so all of this won't come back to you, you know, really quickly. So please feel free to reach out and ask questions. Uh, what outcome area? 
So this outcome area question, this is the first question about what outcome area. There will be a second one. This one is broad. So for uh, new planning and new implementation grantees, you don't necessarily have a logic model. You haven't, well, maybe you have received your information from Greenbush or is coming, so you haven't selected your strategies yet based on your risk and protective um, factors, <laughs> based on your risk and protective factors. And so you're, you're doing what you do as a collaborative. You're addressing alcohol, problem gambling. I heard Juan on earlier, uh, marijuana, mental health, prescription drugs. So this is your opportunity to say, we're covering it all. This is what we're doing. The, your answer to this question changes, however, when you uh, nail down what your risk and protective factors are. So if you're in your community, if alcohol is going to be uh, the specific risk and protective factor that you're going to address, then you're going to begin selecting alcohol. So that, and, and again, that uh, help question is there for you to um, answer that question. It's a broad outcome for this one though. Uh, the SPIF phase, um, for now, um, planning and the beginning uh, implementation, the new implementation grantees, you're in the assessment. And the, at the beginning is the only time when you're in a specific SPIF phase. The SPIF phase is iterative. So you can be building your capacity. And, and actually, I just told a lie, that's not true. Because if you're building your sectors, if you're looking for people to engage in your sectors, um, if you're thinking about um, what type of data you're going to be getting from Greenbush, you're, you're doing all that, you're going to be in those SPIF phases you know, from, from one accomplishment to the next. So I'm correcting myself. It's not as if you're in assessment and then you're, you're not doing anything else. You're, this is going to be a cycle. And so really thinking about how, what it is that you're doing and behind that question mark are uh, definitions of the SPIF phase you can see it says modifying. We're actually gonna have some drop downs uh, in a month or so related to assessment to help you really fine tune assessment, capacity building, planning, because sometimes they do look one and the same, but they are not. So um, we'll have some more information there to help you narrow that down. Okay, we can continue. These are the sectors that um, I heard Chris mentioned earlier. And um, he did say that sometimes, you know, uh, one connection with a, co a coalition or a person could help you uh, support the engagement, pardon me, of more than one sector. And so that is another um, part of data that we collect. We want to know what sectors are engaged uh, in your activities. Stella, yes. I'm gonna jump in. We are at about four minutes until noon. Okay. Um, is this an okay time to, to break for questions and then break for lunch? Absolutely, this is a good time for me. Okay, so thank you very much, Dola. Does anybody have any questions, understanding that this is still orientation training and that a lot of these things will make more sense when you start doing them? Um, but does anybody have any questions offhand right now? I would just like to remind people that the chat will be sending these slides out too, and these slides will be a really, really great reference for when you go to do your first CCB entry, because um, this is really walking you through each yeah. screenshot. So again, I know it's a lot of content, um, but you'll, you will have the slides for reference too. Yep, yep, that's a good reminder. All right. So we will take a break uh, for lunch and catching up on personal matters or work things that have been boiling and you need to get them off the burner. 
Um, we'll start back up at one o'clock. And so appreciate you all joining us so far this morning. We'll come back at one o'clock and we will get done early unless somebody gives me the opportunity to go on one of my kind of random tangents, but I won't do that now. So let's see you all again at one o'clock. Hey, Chad, we have a question in the chat. Oh, yeah. Yeah. What's that? Uh, will the chat be available for future reference as well? Yeah. So that will be that will be something that will be recorded and downloaded and I'll share it in that training folder on the workstation. Thank you. You bet. Okay, so we will now take a break until one o'clock. So see you all again soon. No, no, I like that okay. I think we, the last uh, slide we talked about was um, sectors. And so welcome back everyone. We're gonna complete um, our review of the accomplishment form and uh, if anyone's new don't worry this is being recorded as chad just said and uh, we will have some some uh, additional training so after the section question now we're asking you to tell us about the length of the activity so how long did it take you to complete um, the accomplishment uh, if you had a 30 minute meeting, 30 minutes. If you had, if you were implementing something um, in a school setting, um, maybe it's an hour over three days. And so that would be um, three hours. So we're looking for the length of activity. And there's also a help uh, text button there to tell you how to enter the number of hours or what, uh, what numerical um, entry to make, what type of numerical entry we're looking at. Um, this does not include administrative or preparation time. So we're just looking for the actual implementation time. Not that, let's say for this particular uh, PowerPoint, it took me a couple of hours, days, to get the um, to get the information together that I needed to present today, but the actual training um, for me today is you know less than two hours. So just the implementation time, frequency, um, how many times was the activity delivered, and so this um, you'll have this question often depending on what you're doing, and so again. Don't feel bad about having to ask, you know, what do you mean about this? Um, the example I'm going to use today is, uh, so we consider one week a reporting period. So that's because at the end of each uh, week, you're required to have your CCB entries in. So one week is the reporting period that we are re referencing in this question. So um, for a school, you might have a couple of different classes. It's a couple of different classes and it's the same evidence-based strategy. So for that particular uh, frequency, the frequency we see, oh, I said couple, but let's say you did over three days. Three is the frequency. For this type of um, accomplishment, you're going to do this one time in this week. So you're only going to attend this training one time. We're only going to provide this training one time in this week, so it's one. And for the most part, most of your frequency responses will be one, okay? And again, it's a question that, um, depending on what you're doing, It'll make you ask yourself again. So please, uh, please feel free to do that. To do that, uh, what type of media is this, if applicable? So for the questions again, I'm just going to re reiterate: um, if it's not applicable and it's a it's a required question, there is an option for N A. So uh, you can't skip a required response the form won't let you save. So always look for the NA opportunity. Um, the type of media, 
would be, um, did you post it on Facebook? Um, was it a newspaper? Did you hand out a flyer? Was it a presentation? There will be a list of entries there for you to select from. Um, amount of media. The easiest um, response to amount of media is, you know, if you're handing out something, if you went to a community fair and you took 100 brochures um, and you brought 50 back, then you handed out 50. That's, that's like the easiest. The most difficult or challenging one are social media posts. And so that is again, another place where you'll have questions. Um, we have a cheat sheet uh, and there, I think it's linked. If it's not linked in that help text uh, now, it will be that will give you um, some measurements for how to, some measurements and resources for how to count the number of media. If you're posting something on social media and not just something, when you're posting on social media and it is um, a media entry, it's when you are providing a, a way to counter something. So if we're talking about alcohol, if we're talking about marijuana, then how do I not uh, take a drink within 30 days? How do I not, you know, it's, you're giving them a solution. So not that you are having a meeting with your coalition and you happen to be talking about alcohol and marijuana, you're not addressing, or are you talking about posting it on your media or you're talking about putting together a, um, a brochure. It's when you're actually providing a solution. It's when it's a media uh, entry. So, uh, when I go back to my initial conversation, the most challenging ones are social media, movie theaters. There, it's so great that you guys and some of you guys who are on here who have done it before are able to get your It Matters campaigns posted in um, uh, in movie theaters, and we might not even have that problem since we can't go to movie theaters anymore. Goodness, you don't realize how many things have changed until you start talking about it. But if that ever becomes the case again, that one is another challenge. And again, just feel free to reach out to us. Next slide, please. Who were the targeted participants served, involved, or intended, and the underline to be most immediately impacted by this activity? So one of the uh, challenges we notice here is that you might have a community event to address um, alcohol or marijuana among youth 12 to 17 years old. That is your target audience. If your community event was designed to invite that particular age group. 12 to 17 year olds. Of course, 12 to 17 year old, I'm probably going to bring my parent or my little sister or my little brother. What the answer that we want here is who the target audience is, not who attended. The flip side of that is, let's say you um, have a community meeting for parents. Um, Parents are a wide range, you know, can vary from age rate, age wise. And so it really becomes important that you remember to use your, um, your roster so that you are able to identify, you know, who were the parents that were there? Who were the um, students? Because students sometimes will sign in. We, this question needs to be tapered, you know, down to as best you can, the most immediately impacted and not who attended. So that's the challenge uh, that we have with that question. Other than that, I think you guys will do great with this question. I feel bad for the people who just are uh, new planning and new grantees. You're getting the talking to for how other people have answered, but consider it encouragement to help you do better. All right, let's go to the next one. All right, the number of individuals served or reported 
um, that's so we're going to go back to that demographic uh, roster that you guys are going to use um, when you're meeting people in the public um, outside of your coalition uh, and actually in your coalition groups as well. Uh, you'll be completing a demographic report so that we can uh, complete our national outcomes measures data, data report. We use the, that data for that, and you can also use it to, dis, uh, to determine if there are other demographics that you are missing when you are serving others or when you're hosting uh, different uh, information, when you're hosting meetings to disseminate information in your communities. That is your community, is your, is your meeting representative of the demographic of people you have in your community. So this is a super important question. On the form, uh, it's requesting you to enter a number. So if there were nine participants, you'll enter the number nine. Um, the big thing for this question is that there's also a separate, I should have uh, did a live of the community checkbox, but we'll get an opportunity to do that. There is a separate form that uh, you'll have the opportunity to, to break down that number nine. How many men, how many women, what age group, what race, um, were they ever, uh, do they ever serve um, in the army? Um, I say an army, but there's another word that covers all of them. Can't think of it right now off the top of my head, but. Military? Yes, thank you any military engagement. And some of those things you won't, I mean, maybe you're close enough in your community where you'll know that, but again, I have to point you back to the demographic uh, reporting, really important that you get that information there so you can complete the form in its entirety. Um, the relationships with partners, sometimes you will host a meeting with someone in the community you're sharing and disseminating information about your coalition. Um, the smaller the group, the closer the relationship, the more likely that you'll be able to ask to, for your uh, partner to share that information with you if it's not your meeting, but you are participating in it to support um, your accomplishments related to your KDADS uh, activities. And so that is what we're re referencing there. Um, what the most difficult place probably to um, get that data and you probably won't have that data at all, the, the demographic data is when you're at a large community event and you know there's a, a large amount of people there. Again, I'll go back to the example of passing out brochures. We don't expect you to get the demographics of the persons you're passing the brochures out to. Um, sometimes the events will be so large, you'll just take the, the number of people that the organizer says attended. So uh, there's a range there, depending on the size of the group, as to how narrow you'll be able to uh, get the demographic information down to. And we'll have a participant description training actually specifically for that and for um, retrieving your participant description data as well. And we can go forward, chat. This is actually the end of the accomplishment form. Uh, these two questions will remain the last question, are you KU work group staff, will, will always be no. Uh, the first question could change to yes if after we get into your accomplishment, your, you've entered quite a few accomplishments and we're either doing um, community checkbox training or sense making, we may ask you to go back and reconsider or have questions about how you answered a question and so we would send you a link to that particular uh, entry, uh, gain clarity from you. And if you decide to change the question, um, then you would say yes, so that we know that we would need to go back and reevaluate the question based on your modification. 
Next slide, please. This is an example of the participant description tab uh, to your, it's to my right, so I think it's gonna be to your left, the participant description with the gold at the top, the gold bar at the top, that's where you're going to um, break down the number of people that you served and give us, um, this is the race information. And Chad, if you um, go forward, I think I've broken the whole form down. I don't, and one more, yes. So then you'll have your gender information and your age groups. And you can even, in your demographic form, you can group your ages together like this. That would help you. And you can move forward. And then here's the military participants information. So not specific to which armed forces, but were they involved? Are they veterans? So Chad, you're circling both of those and thank you for that. Um, Let's, can you uh, tab back maybe two slides? Okay, that right there. So the number served, let's say I had nine persons um, attending my meeting. Um, let's say we've been meeting for a while. Uh, and of that nine persons, two of them were new. So I still had a total of nine, but two of my participants were new. The secret or the challenge to completing this form successfully is that the row below that says num in each category. So we just looked at race, age, um, gender, military, um, all of those, they all have to equal nine under number served and two under new participants, regardless to what you select. So you could have um, seven white and two black. So that equals nine, okay? Your new participants could be one Asian, one Chinese, that equals two. So that's the key. Whatever you answer under total number served or total new participants has to equal that same number in each of those categories. Okay, thank you, Chad. And you can go ahead and move past participant description slides. Okay. This is showing you, uh, as earlier when, uh, when we started, we started talking about the workstation and we refer to the workstation as your uh, communication hub. This is just an example of one of the types of resources that would be uh, the, to your left here under KPICI resource documents. This is an example of a resource that's there, the demographic roster to the right is an example of the uh, blog site where you can kind of scroll through that. There's usually, there is um, information there about the various parts of the community checkbox that people usually have frequently asked questions about. So feel free to be there. Um, we mentioned graphs earlier and I'm not gonna go into training for the graphs, but this is what the graphing platform looks like each county has um, the, we can say this is a file folder of graphs and behind that file folder are several types of graphs we're going to be cleaning that uh, up so if you're um, someone who's been around for a while some of those graphs are going to go away and we'll be um, entering your updated graphs you're able to modify the graphs and in a couple of months, 
we'll have some training on building the graphs for you as well. And yes, Chad has a folder. Thank you. Sorry. Oh, <laughs> I, you're fine. Afternoon doodling. I was drawing a lock on mine so that you can't take mine away. I, I won't take your folder away. Okay, good. <laughs> no, no, no. And we can go on to the next one. And move along, please. I think I've talked about resources and training quite extensively. We will, I mentioned earlier, uh, graphing can be done based on the, the way you answer the, the form is where we get the data to graph. Um, graphing can be done based on the evaluation questions for the KPC, your SPF phase activities, uh, things that you've indicated in your logic model. Uh, when you get to that point, um, action steps in your action plans and accomplishments over time. And we just talked about the, uh, the participant description form, but the report uh, from participant description will also give you the list of information that is here. So you can pull participant data based on a strategy, uh, based on an activity. If you want to see if you've progressed or if you serve if you are serving uh, the demographic that you intended to serve um, the participant description data will give you that information as well and it's pretty great when you compare it pair the participant description reporting with the graphing activities with the activities that are graphed and uh, it doesn't hurt this bad, but I kind of like this. Uh, but so anytime you have help, uh, we're there for you. We're there to lift the heavy weight, okay? I'm glad it's not that bad, Dola. It's no, it is not that bad, <laughs> no. No, no, no. All right, thank you very much, Dola. And we'll move on to talk a little bit about more specifically some of the technical things to do with the deliverable documents um, in the workstation. But before we move on from this, are there any questions um, at this point about community checkbox or documenting accomplishments? Okay. All right, we will move on. And <clears throat> these are a couple more screenshots just to show you um, where you'll find these things. And I'm going to exit out of the PowerPoint here and show you um, what it looks like if, if I can get there in real life, virtual real life. Um, <clears throat> this is again when you click that button for deliverable, key picky deliverable templates, it opens up this kind of a view, which is a list of the different deliverable documents that are there for you to download on your computer, save and upload to your folder which is where this is pointing here for the planning grant cohort five. Um, this is a community folder that you have. And so you'll open this folder and drag and drop or upload your deliverable document um, that you've got completed. And so I'm gonna show you that real quickly if my internets will work. <clears throat> Let's see. All right, so, and for Joe and Terry, um, have you been on the workstation at all yet? It's okay if you say no. Okay, and so that's, that's completely understandable. Um, <clears throat> This is what it will look like, only you won't have as many, like Dola said, you won't have as many tabs or as many words. It will be cleaned up to only show um, your project, your initiative, and your, um, your own community's folder. Um, but what we keep referencing is the deliverable templates documents button. And so if you click on that, it will open up this list of the different deliverable documents that are on um, the, the list for your full year. And so, and there are a couple others here that are not for planning grantees only. There are a couple of that are for implementation grantees. And you'll know them by name and know what's expected of you before the end of your process. So this is where you do some of the 
technical documenting of the process that you've done for your planning grant phases. And so you'll click on these documents, it'll open it up in Microsoft Word, download it to your computer or your network or some sort of a drive, complete it, upload it um, to your, save it on your own machine or your own storage space first. Um, and then you'll, <clears throat> you'll move it to, you won't leave it here because that's, those are the blank ones. Um, so if I am from Leavenworth County and I'm reporting on our activities and I am documenting our KPC capacity building plan, that eight page document that we talked about earlier, I'm working on that on my own machine and then I'm gonna either drag it and drop it somewhere in here where it will upload it to my folder or I'll just upload it and like you would normally to upload a folder from, from your computer or some saved folder so then it will go there and you'll be able to reference it. You'll be able to keep track of those things pretty well organized um, to look back on. And then the other thing that I'll show you is, because we talked about it, is um, this KPIC training materials folder. There's a long list there, so I'm still trying to figure out a way to consolidate some of this, but um, these current year, 2020 to 2021, that's the year of your project. And so if you go in here, you'll see this completed training folder will have files from the training that we just offered located in here. And, and so they're not there yet, but um, we're in this upcoming training for orientation. So if I click on that, I can go in here and find orientation and CCB. And before I go too much further, because I've been talking for a little while, can you see what I'm talking about or is it only on my screen? Okay, you can see it. <laughs> okay, good, thank you. Um, so if you click in here and this file will be updated because it's not the latest draft, but if you click on this, you'll have the slide deck from today's training. So you can go back to this. It will be in the completed training folder um, by the end of today. You can go back in there and get the slide deck from the training that we just, just have had. Um, so that will be true for all of the trainings that you'll complete during the year. Um, and so that's something that could be, ought to be pretty useful. If there are things that um, you wish we would do differently with the KPC workstation, with the community checkbox, with the KPC website, um, any of the things that we're doing, we, we, can't, we can't say that we'll give you instant gratification and make magic happen and everything will be suited to your liking. But we would like your input, we would like your feedback on how to make these spaces more useful to you. Um, and so that's something that we're, we're updating as we go through the year. So even in this folder here, resources by SPIF step. These are broken down into folders by strategic prevention framework step. And so if you click on those, you'll get a a list of a few resources that people have found to be helpful or useful. And so we're not gonna go clear into the weeds on some of this, into the details on some of this, but I just wanted to let you know those things are there for us to be able to share um, and offer them to you in a way that we wanna make, we wanna do whatever we can um, to help you be successful. And so if there are things that we can do better to help you be more successful, let us know. Um, so I'm gonna move on and pass the mic to Chris. All right, thanks Chad and thanks Dola and thanks to all of our presenters uh, this morning. Um, so what's next? Um, so <clears throat> we're sure that you all are ready to jump out the gate and, and get moving and get going. Um, so there's some dates um, and events that we have put together um, that we expect that you to attend. And earlier you heard me mention um, some of this um, may have may change in regards to COVID-19, although we do have the next training as KSAPs as online. Um, but the other ones um, we had scheduled for those to be face-to-face. -face. And um, so I just touch bases on this real quick quickly. Um, if it's not in regards to um, the governor recommendation where you can't um, attend and if you're okay with um, 
going to an agency, for instance, let's say if DECA um, was to open up their doors um, based on their guidelines regarding, um, um, you know, the six foot um, spacing, wearing a mask. And if you're okay with that and, you, and, and, and they're open to um, inviting you, you're welcome to go. Um, we also had talked about keeping that open where it could still be um, um, online um, if you don't feel comfortable um, with that. Now, hopefully when things get back to normal, whatever that may look like, um, and let's just say that there's no guidelines and everything is back to where we can start um, meeting face to face, um, based on the agreement that we sent to you all, not the agreement yet, I'm sorry, um, in the, um, the RFA, um, you saw that um, we made strong recommendations um, that you're required to attend um, these meetings or have someone in person. So once we do get back to normal, there won't be a second option where you could um, pick or choose. So I just want to make sure I reference that um, once we do get back to uh, normalcy. So again, you see the next um, date is August 24th through the 27th. Um, that's KSAPs that'll be online, um, followed by the assessment and capacity training, September 9th, um, the following day, behavioral health disparities and cultural competency. Um, then we have the CCP, CCB training and technical assistance, October the 8th, um, followed November the 18th by planning, implementation, and evaluation. Um, another training um, around CCB training and technical assistance, December the 10th. Um, then uh, since making uh, documentation review, this is for cohort four, um, January 28th, and then sustainability. Um, this will be a recording um, that we have already done that will go out um, by J February 26th. And another training that you will uh, continue getting updated on is the CCB training around March 11th. And then the uh, last thing we have here is data and evaluation workshop, April 22nd to uh, 21. So just continue just to um, you know, watch your emails, um, either it'll be from KDADS or it'll be from um, one of the, uh, the, um, the teams or the contractors. Um, most likely probably Chad does a lot of correspondence um, with information if anything was to change or uh, some updates in regards to um, how those trainings would take place. And so again, and we're very flexible and we understand um, right now um, there is a, uh, from the governor with how schools will be operated at starting after um, Labor Day. And um, so if you have any questions on how to do that work or if you're connecting with the school, um, please feel free to reach out to um, our staff, Lindsay, uh, Stephanie, um, and the entire team. Because uh, again, we all have went through this um, back in March through May and, and we can give you some examples of how to continue the work where it doesn't hold you back so we can keep the work moving forward. Um, next slide, please chat. And again, so um, the coalition capacity survey that was talked about earlier, um, this link um, will go out to all coalition members, um, email by 729 with the reminder email on 85. Um, the uh, Wichita State and the CCB training participants in your projects online trainings will go through the go-to meeting links being sent to contacts who have requested to participate. Uh, be sure to review the KCTC participant rates for your community. Um, if it is below 60%, contact your community support, support specialist um, immediately, um, rather by phone or email, um, and then review the KCTC resources to find ways to increase your participation rates. And uh, next slide, chat. So as we come to a close again, we have often, uh, most of us have reflected on that. We know the information that you had received today um, was a lot and um, thankfully um, it is recorded. Um, Chad will be sending out um, the slides and as well the, uh, the chat uh, comments for you to go back and reflect on. And as well, we all are uh, available as well, email, phone call, if you have any questions um, that you didn't get a chance to ask now, um, feel free to get a hold of us. And as I close, I do want to state this. I know that there's several that may be on the call or on the Zoom meeting. Um, and, and if you feel that you're not able to continue to move forward or you're waiting um, for your agreement um, that I sent out an email on July 1st um, in regards to our internal process. So we're still waiting on um, just some, some um, signatures um, just based on how we're working away from home now um, and impacted our 
fiscal department and the other individuals that are involved with our concurrences, but we are working diligently um, and exped expeditiously to uh, get those moved forward and to update you on those as, as we get information. And um, so that should be coming out hopefully um, soon where you will receive your agreement um, to review um, for signature along with the financial report um, that Lindsay talked about that you can review. And there's some updates that we might request to make some changes to that as well. Um, so that's pretty much all that I have. Um, and if there's any questions, this is your time to um, ask any questions in regards to the uh, training today. All right, so if there's no questions, um, again, um, feel free to um, reach out to us by email or phone um, if you feel safer by reaching out at that way of asking the questions or, or giving any comments, uh, we can um, certainly take that as well. Um, as we come to the end, um, in closing, um, one thing that we you'll get familiar with um, is after most of all of our trainings, um, we ask you to do an evaluation, which is really important to us. This is how we're able to continue to drive our work um, to make it better um, in the future. Uh, for instance, next year, we'll do this training again with the new group. So if there's anything that you um, can answer based on the evaluation, please provide that information to us. Um, and we look forward to um, receiving it. Um, I think it's available in the uh, chat area. Uh, Chad is uh, leaving for you there. Um, again, thank you for um, attending and you all have a great rest of the afternoon. And Chad, I'll turn it back over to you if you have anything else to say. All right, thanks a lot, Chris. <clears throat> that was really helpful. And yeah, please do uh, respond and let us know how this event was for you all um, in the evaluation survey link there shared in the chat. Um, we'll use that to um, make sure that we can adapt our, our training events through the year um, so that it can best fit your needs and um, yeah, all of the competing demands that you have. But um, does anybody else from the training team have any other things that you want to say before we wrap things up a little bit early today? Okay. Does anybody want to spend some time watching me click on things on the internet again? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> jo jo Joe's hey. a good sport. <laughs> yes. Chat, sorry. Yeah, go ahead. Did you go through the KPC website? We did not go through the KPC website. <clears throat> um, and part of my reasoning for that, I suppose, is that it in the next three months it will be changing. And so um, as some of you are familiar with website changes, um, you know that that's a process. But I, I will share real quick, um, and then I'll, I'll commit to me sh shutting up by 150 um, for, for sure. So um, let's see. The KPC website is kansasprevencioncollaborative.org. And so I've sent a message to, to folks a little bit and we wanna make sure that our coalition directory page is updated. And so that's part of the reason that we're asking for the name of your coalition and if you've gone by any other names. Um, <clears throat> and so we want to make sure that we have your contact information there correct. Um, for example, just I know that this needs to be updated. And so we've, we've got some more recent information to share for Marion County. And so I'd like for us to do that in our next update on the map. And that won't take too long. If you're wanting to look at um, this by a few different regions, you can. You can look at it by uh, KDAD's service region. You can look at it by DECA service region. And so this is where you would go to find who your, um, who your community support specialist is. So if I'm in Marion County, I click on the county, Crystal Dalmasso's name will come up and her contact information, as well as the other coalitions in your DECA service region will show up here in the list. If you click on one of those, then you get their contact information as well. So I feel like that might be a helpful way for you all to learn from each other. We've also got it divided up by hospital catchment area and population density in case you are from a um, 
densely settled rural community. I want to see who some of your peers are in the community. You can kind of look at that and see how how some peer uh, size communities, population size communities, do some of the work that they do uh, related to prevention strategies. Another part of the maps that we will update again <coughs> using a lot of support from Greenbush <coughs> is the Governor's Behavioral Health Services Planning Council Prevention Subcommittee <coughs> excuse me, has um, prioritized a, a list of behavioral health data indicators. And so these are, this is um, from the past year or two, there will be a new update to this in the next few months because that subcommittee has reprioritized. But if you wanted to look, for example, at 30-day student alcohol use, this data comes from the KCTC student survey. Um, so you could click on your county and see a lot of good information here just for a snapshot picture of how does my county compare to the past years and how does my county's student reports compare to um, other counties of similar size. And then if you click on this link, it brings you up to um, a report. This is a one pager summary data report um, that may be really useful for you to look at how is your county doing compared to in the past and compared to other other counties, especially peer counties. So there are a few different things that you can do with that. Um, and it's a pretty useful tool to, to go in and learn with. Um, we also have on the website here under coalitions, <clears throat> we have some more information about the SPIF or Strategic Prevention Framework. Um, so this is a resource that you can share with coalition members, community members as well. Um, we've got the what's new. So a new thing coming up is the Kansas Prevention Conference. It's every year. This year we're going virtual. It's going to be in October, October 14 through 16. So there's a lot of information about that here. Um, you can also look at news and highlights, calendar, blog entries, and then we have a pretty much a monthly newsletter. If you want to look in the resources tab, you'll find a lot of information there too. And so I'm going to click on this first one, e-learning modules. DECA has provided a lot of resources, a lot of toolkits, um, a lot of informational kind of sets of virtual documentation and um, online recorded webinars. So you could go here and learn and learn and learn and even share some of these things with your community coalition members for them to do as homework in between meeting times or something like that all from the comfort of their home. Um, there are several other things that we could dig into, but I probably won't hear, but um, there's, there's a ton of information here. And in our, the, only, the last thing I'll click on in this section is in our resource library. You can, we've, we've kind of, you can get exhausted going through Google, going into deep Google late at night. And so we've wanted to review some resources and then share them so that you don't have to go through all of that never ending Google, deep Google trail. Um, so we've collected some, reviewed some resources that are available out there on the internet. Some of them are, um, there has some evidence base. Some of them are research studies. Um, some of them are, it might be like a blog post or um, a more self-help sort, of sort of a take on things. But you can go to this resource library online, um, search by any of these topics that we, these audiences that we have prioritized or this list of topics. You can also search and find some different information that way as well. So hopefully there's something there that talks about something that you are concerned about, passionate about, care a lot about. Um, and if there's not, let us know and we'll make some adaptations to that as well. Um, I think, well, at the bottom of every page, you'll see a link to the subscribe button. And I would recommend that your coalition members subscribe to get KPC news updates. Uh, we try to share information about upcoming trainings, upcoming events, um, upcoming funding opportunities, different things like that. Um, so you could click on this link and it will take you to a subscription page. We also have quick links to the workstation. KCTC student survey data, Kansas Young Adult survey data, KB HID, uh, and the National Helpline for some more information about suicide. 
Um, so that's a quick overview of the website because I wanted to be done by 1.50. Um, but anytime on a Friday night, if you're bored and you want to look at the internet or spreadsheets and have some popcorn, that's what I do on Friday nights. So let me know and I'll send you a Zoom, Zoom link. <laughs> He's we'll not joking. A, we'll have a wild, <laughs> we'll have a lot of fun. <clears throat> Excuse me. All right. So after all of that, are there any questions or concerns or excitement or regret or anything like that? We can handle it all. All right, so we will let you go and appreciate you going ahead and clicking on that link to complete the evaluation survey to let us know how this was for you. And we look forward to seeing you next. So hope you get up to a really good start this year. Bye all. Bye, have a Bye, great everybody. day. <laughs>